Greetings, future social workers. Welcome back to Case Management. I am excited for another lecture this week. Thank you for hanging in there and being great sports. Uh, today is the lecture you've all been waiting for. I know that when you saw the syllabus, this is the one that you wanted more than cultural humility, more than any inspirational talk. What you wanted was how to write effective notes. I know that's what you wanted. And this is what you've been waiting for for this course. We've reached the apex of case management. I'm just kidding. I know that this isn't what you're most excited about, but I also wanted to let you know this in particular is one of those lectures today that if anything is going to prepare you for your future careers as social workers, this is equally important, okay? And so what I promise to do in this lecture is make this material as brief as possible. And also what I'm going to do is uh, make this material as practical as possible to the point to which I'm going to give you real life uh, advice um, from my experiences, not only writing case notes for the past 15 years, um, but also surviving audits, um, audits both on my own case notes and uh, when I was in uh, leadership positions, being audited uh, for all of my staff's case notes, um, both from county as well as state officials when it comes to case management. And so I promise you the information I give you today will not only be relevant, um, but it will be completely completely applicable to your future careers, okay? And so what I'm going to do is commence with sharing our screen and we will dive into today's lecture. So for today's lecture, we are now moving right along. We are actually beginning the tail end of this, uh, this class in terms of our, our timeline. We have moved through the first two stages of the gym model okay we talked about engagement uh, we talked about planning and now we are moving into the third stage of the gym model referred to as intervention okay in wraparound the third model is referred to as phase three or sorry the third phase is referred to as implementation so as in the gym model we have intervention in wraparound we call it implementation same phases though okay just slightly different language now like I said before, this is what you're looking forward to, right? So your future, your future as social workers could look something like this. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Office Space, the movie, one of my favorite, but uh, in, in, in the language of our boss from Office Space, yeah, if you could go ahead and do your paperwork, that would be great. I don't know how many times I've probably said that as a supervisor in the field of social work, but that's a reality. Look forward to hearing that from your supervisor. Uh, if that's the case. And if you're a Toy Story, uh, Toy Story um, fan, then you've got Buzz Light here. You're talking to you as the future social work paperwork, paperwork everywhere, right? And so for many of you, I know that this is not the fun part of your job. When I was done working with clients who have been through very difficult moments in their lives, I wasn't looking forward to coming back and having to write it all down. But I started to understand the importance of paperwork and the importance of documentation as I moved along. The purpose for this lecture today is to assist you with those tips, useful practical tips that will move you through paperwork. Again, this is the entry level. I'm not expecting to be experts in this, but if you can take some of this into your future career, this will save you much time, much aggravation, all right, and uh, hopefully prevent as steep as a learning curve is what I had to learn moving into my early days of case management and documentation. So here's the goal. I know none of you are saying this, right? I love doing paperwork on evenings and weekends. Said no professional ever, right? No one has said that. Yes, instead of going out with my good friends on a Friday night to celebrate one of my dearest friend's birthdays, I can't because I have mental health progress notes due by 12 p.m. tonight. Otherwise, I'm not gonna meet my percentage and my boss is gonna have a talking to, with, to me on Monday morning. I know none of you want that. I don't want that for you either. And so this is what this lecture is designed to do, to give you tips on how to make the most out of your paperwork related to case management. Now, I want you to also um, tune into, you may need to reference this particular lecture later when you're doing your assignments related to documentation on the syllabus. So please, just as a reminder, don't be afraid to, to reach back into your lecture material and revisit some of this content. It'll help you with your assignments later, okay? All right, let's go ahead and jump in. So what I'm gonna be doing today for our case management to give you tips on documenting like a social worker, let's put on two hats today. 
one of the hats we're gonna put on first and then we'll quickly ditch that one for the more difficult hat, okay? But don't worry, like I said, I'm not expecting to be experts. We're gonna get through this, okay? So in your time as a social worker, you can be completing two types of documentation. Those will fall into two very broad categories. One can be clinical documentation, two would be anything non-clinical. Clinical documentation is the one that will be our primary focus today because oftentimes, in my experience and as well as experience supervising social workers in the past, the clinical is a little bit tricky, okay? Once you get it down, you're gonna be absolutely fine and you won't sweat it anymore. And I'm gonna give you tips on how to get it down as quickly as possible. However, it's not always easy and it's not always fun to do, so that's why I'm gonna give you these tips to make it helpful. Non-clinical paperwork in, on documentation, anything like your court reports, your case plan, minutes from meetings, minutes from staffing meetings, all of these kind of things. Your clinical is only referring to uh, what you're doing in your therapeutic sessions if you're gonna provide therapy to clients. Now here's what's important to understand. Some of you may be saying, well, I wanna do macro social work, I wanna work with policy and legislation, I don't see myself having to do any clinical work. If that's the case, um, uh, let me give you some advice related to that. That may be the case as you move later into your career. As I started to move more into the macro, I started doing less of the clinical notes. However, it's important to understand in the beginning of your career, more often than not, whether you're going to, to be a therapist or not, you may still be doing clinical work that is considered what we refer to as Medi-Cal billable, which means you are claiming funds or your agency is claiming funds from the state of California in combination with federal funds to provide mental health services to your clients, whether that's foster youth, incarcerated youth, individuals without housing, veteran services, you're doing anger management groups, whatever the case is. And so even though you are not doing clinical work as the clinician, the therapist facilitating therapy sessions, you may also be providing clinical work through groups that you're doing or even a meeting and updating your um, families on the case plan. So even though I didn't pursue licensure in the clinical sense because I didn't want to open a private practice, that wasn't for me. I want to go the clinical route. I mean, sorry, the macro route. What's important to understand is I still had to do therapeutic sessions. I was still doing uh, psychoeducational groups and that still required me to bill for Medi-Cal. So these tips are still relevant to you. Okay, what I don't want you to do is maybe check out in this section of the lecture today and then miss out on an opportunity to enter the field strong and successful, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. When it reference to clinical notes, they must be considered billable and under Medi-Cal or Medicaid. You don't need to worry about what that all means now. You'll receive adequate, and I mean ample training in that later in your career. But what's important to understand is it's only relating to what is billable under Medi-Cal. That's what we call Medicaid in California, okay? It captures only what is billable. It has no interest in Medi-Cal notes and mental health progress notes of documenting um, particular successes of the family if they don't relate to the treatment plans. It has nothing to do with food resources if it doesn't relate to a treatment goal. Anything that does not relate to the treatment, bowl, uh, the treatment goals are considered irrelevant in a mental health case plan. Right? It has to be written in clinical language, and I'm gonna explain what clinical language is and actually give you the verbiage that passes audits so that you can write comprehensive notes. I told you this will be 100% applicable. Um, and I'm gonna give you this format here. Now, some of you are saying, burp, what is that? Excuse you. Um, burp is a format. I'm gonna explain what the format is. I'm giving you the burp format for notes because there are different types of, of formats for writing notes. Some counties use SOAP and others use a, a few others. Riverside County Department of Mental Health, referred to as Riverside University Health Systems, RUHS, okay, uh, requires uh, BURP as their format for their notes. And so I'm gonna give you that because that is the most current. And like I said, it'll help you as you step into your career. Now for non-clinical side, and this is where we'll start with some of the documentation for today, and we'll move back into clinical, must be written similar to court minutes, okay? I'll talk about what that means. They're gonna include just the facts. I don't know if any of you grew up watching the show called Dragnet, okay? But there was a line from that old show called Just the Facts, ma'am. And all that meant was that anything that's captured in a non-clinical note is neither opinion nor is it subjective. It is only the real um, statements that have been stated and observed in those meetings. No opinion, no fluff, no wordy language, no poetry. There's no room for any of that, all right? I'm gonna give you tips today on how to write both notes. And the non-clinical note should always align with your meeting agendas, okay? So I'm gonna show you a quick, easy way of doing that as well. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. 
regardless if you're writing clinical or non-clinical notes, all right, here's some commonalities between documenting um, notes like a social worker. Everything in your notes should be objective. Everything in your documentation. It should not lean towards your personal opinion. It's not okay to enter in if you are mad, upset, or shocked, or taken back by what you saw, or even encouraged. It is purely what the facts were. It's objective. You want to be as concise as normal. You will be writing notes for if you have 10 cases, you're going to be writing mental health notes sometimes and non-clinical notes for every one of those cases. You don't need to write pages. Uh, uh, brevity is actually encouraged, but there's a way to do that well. So you can't just be short for the sake of it and leave important facts out. You need to know how to capture the material concisely in order to get your point across to your audience. I'm going to show you how to do that today. Um, obviously, like I said before, absent of personal opinions, non-judgmental, okay, written to the audience who is reading the document. So how you write a mental health note will look entirely different from how you write a court report. Those are two entirely different things. I'm going to show you the differences in language today so that you can kind of get the gist of what this will look like based on which notes you're completing as a social worker. And most importantly, most importantly, all of your documentation, the expectation for social workers is that we complete our documentation in an accurate and timely manner. Accurate and timely is language directly pulled from social work language and the verbiage of our employee handbooks are with the agencies we work with. In fact, I'm going to tell you, and this is a sad reality, okay, is that some social workers oftentimes they are amazing at working with children and families or their clients. They love the one-on-one -on -one approach. Over the years, the sad reality is I've seen social workers let go from their positions because even though they are amazing at working with the clients they're serving, they have not been as strong in the documentation arena. And unfortunately right now, but the reality is, and I wanna prepare you for it, it's why we're doing this lecture, the reality is, is that social work requires a lot of documentation. About half your work right now is going to be direct service with clients. The other half is gonna be documentation. And the reason for that is because the state has and the counties have, have um, required a large amount of documentation in order to justify services, in order to bill in some cases for those services. And so documentation has become a lifeline. Now, for those of us who have been practicing social work for several years, some of our personal opinions might, might lean towards the fact that paperwork um, is killing social work. Um, there are many of us, just so you know, that are advocating on a policy level to address the notion of how much paperwork social workers spend their time doing. So I don't want you to think that that battle is not being waged. However, I would fail as a faculty member if I did not provide you with adequate coaching on what it takes, all right, to, to not only see your clients with a heart for compassion and justice, but to also be able to go back to your office, put on the head component of your work, all right, and effectively write notes, all right, that would allow you to stay, remain within your agency for years to come. So that's the point of this lecture today. All right, so let's start with the non-clinical notes. These are non-clinical, non-mental health related notes. These are generic notes. And for the sake of things, these are a little bit easier to grasp. Um, you can tend to, to um, prepare yourself a little more quickly to complete non-clinical notes. This should look familiar to you. This was a family team meeting agenda that we re referred to in previous lectures, right? And so we knew that the, the outline for the agenda looked like this. We had a heading which you know, included the essential information about where the meeting was held and when and who was there. We have the body of the, the meeting, which discusses things like strengths and icebreakers and topics to discuss. For the sake of this example today, these are just three categories, okay, that I chose that we would talk about for a meeting to provide minutes for your meeting today. And then we have safety, action items, deadlines, and the next time, next meeting time and location. Now for non-clinical notes, even though you'll work for different agencies and you'll work for different um, providers, generally speaking, in a generalist model, these are the information, the information that you're gonna wanna cover. Safety in particular is one that will be on almost every single meeting agenda that you ever have as a social worker. So it's important to get used to just plugging those updates in now. Here's the best strategy I can tell you for completing non-clinical notes. Build the template for your notes right off of your meeting agenda. This template here literally becomes the template for your minutes. Minutes are important because minutes not only go into the case file. So every time you're done meeting with a family, for example, when I was done meeting with a family as a case manager, I would 
bring my agenda into the meeting. We'd run with the agenda. Sometimes it'd be a couple extra things on there that I didn't anticipate. Then what I would do is I'd return to the office or I'd go to a Starbucks because I had another meeting or whatever the case is. And then what I would do is complete my minutes from the meeting. The minutes from the meeting capture what was discussed, agreed upon, and assigned during that meeting. Those go into the case file. They are, sorry about that, read by your supervisor. In turn, they are also then read by a program director, whoever the case is. What's more important to understand is those can be submitted to the court. At some point is not out of reach to consider that a judge, and I've had this happen in my case, a judge has already sat down in his chambers, called me in because we had some important discussions about a family that needed to be addressed, sat down and read my case notes. The judge is sitting in front of me reading my case notes. I need you to understand that whatever you write in your minutes can be accessed by the court, it can be accessed by public records later, so it's important to understand that these must be accurate, okay? Not to create any pressure or to freak you out, you'll get used to doing this, I just want you to understand the weight behind what you're doing with these notes and these minutes, okay? So, let me give you a scenario really quick. This is a non-clinical scenario, this is a summary that oftentimes I've seen. This scenario here isn't bad. Let's say someone wrote these notes, okay, and I've seen early case managers write notes like this. I was even guilty of writing notes like this early on in my career. Literally just like this. This is what the note would look like. There'd be no headings, nothing else. They would put this in the case now on the case file and life would go on. There's a lot of problems with that, which we won't get into for today's lecture. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with this example. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an example of what an effective note looks like so you can see the difference, okay? A high quality, non-clinical note. So here's an example. Let's look at what happened in this meeting, this family team meeting um, with the case manager. So Samantha and her mother um, met with her wraparound team for their weekly family team meeting. So this is that weekly meeting where everyone gets together, okay? And then the facilitator for the wraparound team brings in an agenda. Samantha, her mother, the wrap facilitator, parent partner, behavioral specialist, and therapist were present for the meeting. Not bad. During the successes portion of the meeting, mom and Samantha shared how happy they were to begin spending more time together. Samantha was excited to go to the mall with her friends over the weekend. Samantha stated she saw a movie and ate lunch with her friends. She also stated that she earned a B minus on her English paper. Mom reported that, going, that work was going well and she has been given more responsibilities at work, which may lead to a promotion. The therapist reported that Samantha continues to make all her therapy appointments and is involved in all sessions. The team shared that their favorite genre of movie, fa their favorite genre of movies and specific favorite movie in that genre as an icebreaker. During the meeting, and it goes on, the team discussed updates related to school. Samantha shared that she is doing well in English, but she's struggling in math. She stated that she is falling behind and does not understand what the teacher's lessons are about. The team discussed options and schedules for math tutoring for Samantha. And Samantha stated she does not want to be tutored by her teacher because the teacher is mean and does not teach well. The team brainstormed alternative, uh, alternatives for additional tutors and the clinician discussed therapy in general terms, confirming that the current treatment goals are still relevant and that Samantha is open and making progress in therapy. Samantha reports that she likes therapy and is going to practice her coping skills with her mom this week. Mom reported that work has been going well, but money has been tight this month because her car needed repairs and tires. She stated she needed to care, um, needed the car, I'm sorry about that, to get to work, and as a result, may not be able to afford utility bills this month. The team then brainstormed resources for mom for utility bills this month. They also discussed rideshare possibilities um, and alternatives such as public transportation, should the issue arise again. Mom also requested assistance with food banks since her grocery budget was also impacted by the car's repairs. Mom and Samantha reported no safety issues this week. Samantha stated she has not cut herself since returning home and is feeling good about things right now. The team assigned the tasks to accomplish for next week's meeting and scheduled the next week's meeting for the following week. This isn't bad, like I said. If you were a first time social worker, I hired you for my agency and you wrote this note, I don't have any major concerns. I also know though that this note is subject to a few concerns during an audit. But at the same time, a note like this is not gonna get you fired. What I want you to understand though is that there are some gaps in this note. First off, it's not clear what was discussed in the meeting in the formatting of the note, okay? If you notice, this note just reads as a quick ja um, jaunt of, of capturing what was discussed in sort of shotgun format. So there's no clarity to this. If you need to go back and sort of sift through notes later, which is common, 
uh, you've been working with a family for a number of months and you're trying to go back and, and, and rehash something that was discussed, then you're going to need a clear format to be able to look through those notes faster. On top of that, there's some things here. This is wordy, okay? It's discussing a lot and it's, and it's accurate and this is good. If you notice, it's absent of opinion. It's not discussing particulars about how people felt or reacted, but it's wordy. Imagine having to write one of these notes, but now you have 15 or 20 clients on your caseload and you have to do one of these each week. Well, this is gonna take a lot of time, okay? On top of that, if you notice down here at the bottom, the team assigned tasks to accomplish for next week's meeting and schedule the next meeting but it's not clear what those tasks were. If an auditor were to audit this note right now, they would wanna know what was assigned, is there progress being made towards the plan? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you now a um, note that is of higher quality, all right, that you wanna to, to end up working towards as a social worker. Again, non-clinical note. So let's take a look at this really quick. This is an actual template, all right, utilized, and if you notice, it's based off of the agenda. Like I said, you take that same agenda, you use all the same headings. Here's that pre, you know, sort of headings of the when, where, and who was present. And you notice then I broke the sections up per the agenda the same way. These are the exact same ones. So let's look here, strengths, icebreakers, topics to discuss. Here are the very three that we're using. And look, it looks like we had an additional topic cover that wasn't um, planned on being addressed in the agenda, safety is always present, and then we have our action items and deadlines. Now, I'm not gonna read you this entire note, but what I'd like to be able to do is let's draw our attention to a couple of things. In an effective note, remember, one of the things we want it to do is be objective, and we want it to be concise. Upside, a concise means that you could write in this form here, in paragraph form, some providers may actually require that you do that. However, whenever possible, try to bullet point your items. Now remember, these are minutes from a meeting. This isn't a court report. In a court report, you're going to need to write in paragraph form, okay? But in some minutes uh, related to your meetings, you can capture what was discussed. So if you notice in mom's piece, I bullet pointed this, right? Mom and Samantha shared that they were spending more time together. Great, Samantha went to the mall with her friends over the weekend. She saw a movie. She got a B plus on her English paper. See, everything's present, but it's in bullet form, much more concise. If you needed to go back and discuss where progress was being made later, you can find it a lot more quickly. If you notice in icebreakers, I didn't share that uh, so-and-so shared, the therapist shared, this is her favorite movie, and this is her favorite genre. I didn't go into all that detail, right? Because that's not essential to the case. I just wanted to document that we did discuss, um, we did discuss uh, icebreakers, we did do an activity, that's all to the extent. Here's where the meat and potato is of your report. When you talk about documents to discuss, or topics to discuss, I'm sorry, school performance, here's what's important to capture. Samantha shared that she is doing well in English and she's struggling in math, and the team discussed options and schedules for math tutoring for Samantha. So now if you notice, I didn't talk about the results of that discussion, right? Because that's what was discussed. However, the, the results of that discussion are down here under action items and deadlines. This is gonna read a lot more clearly for you, an auditor, and your supervisor later. So this is important to understand. So you wanna be deliberate about where you plug your information into your notes. The cleaner you keep it now, the easier it is to go back and reference this later. Also, the easier to explain to a judge. So if a judge is looking through this and he's like, well, what was the result? Or she was like, what was the result of this discussion? Or what happened with therapy? What happened with coping skills? You could say, oh, your honor, that is at the bottom under actions and deadlines. And that is the same for all of my notes. And that way, the judge is going to be able to move through your information easily. I find that when you have an outside reader, someone not close to the case reading notes, the less time they spend on your note reviewing it, the better, especially when it comes to an auditor. That's just an internal tip that I've seen from 15 years of being audited, okay? Therapy updates, let's look at this really quick. If you notice again, the clinician discussed therapy in general terms, because the therapist isn't gonna disclose everything that was going on in therapy, it's confidential, right? Confirming that the current treatment goals are still relevant, this is important for us to know and that Samantha is open to making progress in therapy. Samantha reports that she likes therapy and is going to practice her coping skills with mom this week. Perfect, that's all you need to know. The details of therapy, we're gonna discuss in a mental health note, okay? And I'm gonna share that with you later in this lecture. So now let's look down, so this, this is pretty common, okay? Now here's what we'll see, in this other section, this was added, this was not on the agenda, okay? 
you could add another section on the agenda in case you run into some other topics, which is normal, um, that you didn't plan on discussing that come up. In this case, for this meeting, mom discussed, remember that money was tight, that her car needed repairs and tires. So that was captured here, okay? She stated she needed um, the car. I don't know why I did that, I apologize for that. Uh, to get to work and requested, um, and requested assistance with food banks since her grocery budget was also impacted. So I just captured that under other. Now, if you notice safety, it's always important to understand safety. So you need to think about when you're reporting safety, not only what is being reported in the moment, but should you have to answer to it later. So this is not uncommon, and I'll tell you this is a, a reality to your documentation. In this meeting, at the time that you conducted the meeting, mom and Samantha, Samantha reported no safety issues this week. That's important to understand and to document. It's also important to understand that when a client gives you feedback on how they're doing related to a safety issue, whenever you can put it in the, in the client's language, do that. That's important, okay? So Samantha stated that she has not cut herself since she returned home and is feeling good about things right now. This is important, okay? And the reason being is because I have worked to cases in the past with kiddos in particular. After a meeting with the entire team present, they stated everything was going well. They had no suicidal ideation. They hadn't made any suicide attempts. They hadn't hurt themselves. I have worked with clients in the past that after we left meetings that evening, okay, and God forbid this ever happens to you on a case, I have had clients commit suicide. I've also had clients killed. One was shot in particular after that. When a horrific incident like that occurs, the first thing that's gonna happen is after the um, reporting party, the governing uh, body, so, so the county, um, or the state is made notified of the death of a client, they will open an investigation. It's not if they do, it's when they open the investigation. Usually that will happen within a few days of that death occurring. What's going to happen is every note that you've ever submitted for a case file will be opened and it will be read and it will be reviewed. Every single note, particularly when something happens like a death of a client. And it's important to understand that the notes will be combed through to, to gather a better understanding of what the client was reporting and what the team knew prior to that client's passing. And so there have been times where I have had to yield over my notes to the court because there are investigators going through saying, did we as a team know that there was any potential risk that we didn't plan for when a client passed away a day or two or even 24 hours after we met? with that particular client. So that's very important to understand and it's a brutal reality to why documentation is so important. Equally important to that when we discuss safety are the action items later, okay? This is where we are discussing, not only did we receive reports, but this has to justify the work that we're doing with the families. Oftentimes, and it's not, sometimes it's not malicious, but families are learning at times how to deal with accountability from systems. And families don't like to necessarily, because of previous experiences, be cornered into a situation where a judge is going to ask them why progress hasn't been made on their case. It's not uncommon from time to time that I've had families point the picture and say, I've never seen my RAP facilitator for a whole month. And I'm in court saying, I have seen them. I saw them last week. And a family will say, nope, I never saw them. And we didn't know what we, supposed, we were supposed to be working on. Well, guess what? The judge isn't going to take my word for it. The judge is literally going to say, let me see your case notes, um, uh, Mr. Mexico. I want to see evidence that you have met with this family last week. And guess what? You also want to know, Mr. Mexico, what were you working on with this client at this time? This is where you're going to justify, all right, what you were doing with that family. And so these action items here are very important. So if you notice here in the context of this meeting, the team discussed options and schedules for math tutoring. And notice there is follow-up to my action items. Mom will inquire of alternative tutors for math at Samantha's school and report back to the team in the next meeting. Report back to the team in the next meeting. So if we were standing in court and mom said, I never saw Mr. Mexico for a month, I have proof, one, that we had a meeting, two, that we discussed tutoring, and mom was responsible for an action item as after this meeting. This is important, okay? You'll oftentimes hear that term. You write some other reason why you write notes is to CYA, all right? I won't explain to you what the A stands for. I'm sure you guys know it will stand for a uh, livelier uh, word for rump, right? So cover your rump. We'll call it that right now. And so it's important to understand that the, the more clear you can make these notes and concise, the better it will be for you later on. 
Look at this other one just as an example. The team brainstormed resources for mom for utility bills this month and look at the follow-up. Parent, partner, and mom will apply for assistance through the utilities department on Tuesday, okay? There is a specific action item there that could be tied to this meeting. And finally, let's look at this last one. Mom, remember, said she needed food bank resources. Team provided local resources for mom during the meeting. Mom reports she will go later today and gather food and report back if there are any differences, uh, difficulties in accessing resources. So again, another action item. What's important and a good tip is when you um, are documenting when the team is going to meet with the family next. This is important because like I said, God forbid something happens and your client passes away or is no longer there for the next services and your services are called into question, you're going to want to uh, identify clearly when everyone was supposed to see your client again. So I don't just put the next meeting for our family team meeting when it was scheduled. When the team members have their meetings set, I'm going to write those down too. So if you notice, the next one-on-one -on -one with the parent partner will be Tuesday, uh, March, I'm sorry, uh, June 2nd, wow, at, at 11 a.m. The next one-on-one -on -one with Samantha and her behavioral specialist will be Wednesday, 6-3 at 4 p.m. and her next therapy appointment is scheduled for 6-4 at 4-30. So you see, this is important and this is what we would call doing your due diligence and being thorough in your documentation. If you notice, if you have to do this for every single client and you're keeping it short and sweet, you are conveying your information, you are able to access that information later. It is clear to the audience what happened in this meeting, right? If this is not my case and I've never met this family before, I have a good example of what occurred in this meeting and I know what's gonna happen next, okay? So I hope that helps. Feel free to reference back to this lecture in particular when it comes time for your assignment uh, related to this lesson, okay? Now, we move past that. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna ask you to take off your non-clinical hat, all right? As a social worker, when you sit down to write notes, you're gonna wear two hats, your non-clinical and your clinical. What I'm going to do now is ask you to take off that non-clinical hat and go ahead and put on that clinical hat. Now we're going to think, write, and communicate like a clinician, okay? This is the skill sets that you'll want to have as a social worker when you sit down at your cubicle um, or your fancy swank desk when you become a supervisor, okay, and you have an opportunity to do notes. So now let's cross over into mental health documentation. Whenever you are documenting like a clinician, here's something that you want to consider. It's not enough as a clinician to be able to say, I think my kiddo is getting better, right? If you're providing therapy to a kiddo who's suicidal and someone asks you how th how's therapy going, you don't say, I think, I think they don't want to kill themselves this week. You know, I think they were a little less suicidal at lunch today. I'm really encouraged by what I heard. You have to think of things in a concrete way. But the difficult part as a clinician is how do you quantify, how do you determine if things are really getting better? How do you actually know if a client is less suicidal, less aggressive, less depressed, less anxious than they were last week? A good, a good timeline in the field of mental health, and you will hear this referred to with clinicians, all right, is measuring improvement using three things. You picture a ruler, right? And this ruler is measuring three things as a clinician. It's referred to as frequency, duration, and intensity. How frequently is a behavior going on that you are targeting? How long do those episodes last? And how intense are they? This has been an, an important tool for documenting mental health services for me throughout my career. Let me give you a quick example. You're working with a kiddo who is self-medicating, using marijuana to cope with stress, maybe feeling angry or anxious at home, okay? The child reports that they're smoking marijuana about three to four times a day, okay, and about five days per week. So there's two times that they usually abstain, two days a week, but um, usually they're pretty busy, okay, smoking marijuana those other five days. When they smoke marijuana, each episode, each session lasts maybe about an hour. Maybe they're smoking with friends um, and they're sharing, but he, the individual is spending about an hour's time engaging in smoking marijuana those three to five times per day, okay? Intensity is talking about the notion of how intense the feelings are that are triggering this event. What are they trying to mask out? And so sometimes you may ask for a client to say on a scale of one to 10, all right, how anxious were you feeling during this episode, all right, in smoking on Monday? And they say, you know what, 
I was so scared and I was worried. My dad came home and was yelling and threatening to hit me. I couldn't take it anymore. So I left with my friends. I was feeling it about an eight. All right. And therefore I smoked for an hour with my friends and then I came home. All right, so this is how to measure it because then you know if the client starts reporting that they were only smoking pot once a day now, it's only about half an hour of the duration and they're starting to feel at about a six or seven after working with them for a period of time, you know things are moving in the correct direction. So this is really important to understand. So we refer to measuring behaviors in frequency, duration, and intensity to monitor improvement. Let me give you some examples really quick. All right, so Danny will stop smoking pot. Okay, that's one way to write a treatment goal, but that's not going to pass an audit because it doesn't meet our test of frequency, duration, and intensity. So let me give you a good example, all right? Danny will decrease his marijuana use from twice daily to twice per week, okay? That's a goal, that's measurable. We can actually see if the frequency is decreasing. Strategies for this that you could list on your treatment plan, and this is all written like a clinician, so let's pay attention to the language here, okay? Increasing coping mechanisms, decreasing usage, maybe a 12-step support program, sponsorship, or therapy. These are all things that can be used to address right, this clinical treatment goal of decreasing marijuana usage for Danny, okay? Let's look at another one. Donna will stop hitting her siblings, all right? Again, treatment goal, I've seen these on treatment plans. These won't pass an audit. These won't justify mental health services, okay? We need to be more specific, utilizing frequency, duration, and intensity. So check this out. Donna will decrease physical outbursts with siblings and peers from five days a week to two days a week, okay? In order to address these needs, some of the strategies, the treatment goals that are on here could be verbal and physical um, uh, expression, working on those things, positive coping mechanisms being established, therapy, or even behavioral modification. Sometimes we're here to that as behavioral mod, okay? So get one more. Sharon will stop running away, okay? So again, we know what the goal is here, but we need to sharpen this up a little bit with our clinical language. Sharon will decrease self-endangering behaviors or impulsive behaviors from three episodes per week to one episode per week. Obviously, you're gonna to wanna to get these down to zero, but you can't expect some of our clients based on their history to get it down to zero in a month, right? So, some of those strategies can include establishing safe runaway locations, locations where uh, Sharon and her family will know where she's going when she feels like running away maybe giving Sharon a cell phone so she communicates when she can get there safely, adding coping mechanisms that are positive and helpful, increased support network at home with her friends or her family who can prevent her right from leaving when she feels upset uh, or running away. So do you see how there's a difference between simply Danny's going to stop smoking pot and how we've written it here, or Donna will stop hitting her siblings to how we've communicated that here as a treatment goal, or Sharon will stop running away right? And we've, we've added frequency, duration, and intensity here. So I hope that helps you in that process. Let me break this down and kind of give you an example, okay? So when completing mental health notes, here's one way to look at it, okay? Here's your mental health treatment plan. There's going to be sections in your treatment plan on your template. They're going to include your treatment goals, they're going to relate to strategies or interventions that you have listed specifically on your plan. So let's go back. This were the treatment goal. Okay, all of these in, in yellow. These are your strategies or interventions. These are what you're going to do to meet these treatment goals on your mental health plan. Okay. Mental health documentation are going to include all those notes that you do following your mental health services. So some of you, if you're going to apply for licensure, you're going to be the one providing the, what we refer to as non-family collaterals, what we refer to as the individual okay, therapy appointments with families, referred to as non-family collaterals. Or you may be providing family collaterals to families. Those are the family therapy sessions with everyone together. Okay? Afterwards, you're going to create mental health documentation. Go back and document these on a mental health goal. Everything that you do, the strategies, the treatment goals, they all fall under the mental health plan. They all have to intersect and be aligned, okay? If you decide to develop a treatment goal that does not address the diagnosis of the client, it's not valid and you cannot bill for it, it will not pass an audit. If you decide to implement a strategy that doesn't relate to the treatment goal, so if we're talking about addressing marijuana usage, but now you decide to have a strategy about um, increasing self-worth, 
or self-esteem. If that doesn't relate to marijuana usage, it will not pass an audit, okay? Everything has to be linked together and relate to one another, okay? So some best practice goals that I've learned over 15 years of reviewing and creating mental health documentation is that treatment goals have to be clearly defined, okay? They have to be very precise in how they're written. Again, more detail, the better, like in here, okay? Um, all documentation is tied to these goals. There are specific intervention identified for each practitioner. So if your parent partner, right, is only going to be working with mom on parenting strategies, right, then you don't need to write that the behavioral specialist is doing it also, right? If there's only one person providing that strategy, that one uh, role should be listed there, okay? No more, no less. Each intervention is connected to the treatment goal. Everything's got to be connected, like I said. And effective documentation includes what occurred and the outcome. Don't worry, I'm going to give you examples of all of this in a second. You're going to want to enter each meeting, all right, with an agenda to receive updates related specifically to treatment goals, because that's going to allow you to fashion your note later. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And what you want to do is make sure that each update that you receive from a client, so if you're there to talk about suicidality, substance dependency, and running away, and a client shares with you one update for each of those categories, as a clinician, you wanna make sure that you have responded to each of those categories and you've documented that clearly in your progress note. That's important to understand because if there's no evidence, meaning you didn't write it in the court's eyes, it didn't happen. You can swear under a oath that you discussed these with the client that day, Unfortunately, if it's not reported in the note, it won't be captured um, in reality, okay? So it helps to have a menu of strategies also to consider offering to a client. So if you're going into a therapy session and you know you're gonna address suicidality, substance dependency, and running away, you'll wanna have what options you discussed with your client and established as those coping mechanisms, but you also wanna have a few ideas in your pocket on what to discuss in case those didn't work this week, okay? You wanna brainstorm, explore that. All right, uh, with your client. Good, so I know I'm giving you a lot right here. So let's break this down. How do you document this? Right? What does this look like? At the beginning of the lecture, I talked about that we're gonna use a formatting for your mental health notes referred to as burp. Burp, okay, just like a baby burping, okay? Now, burp in particular is an acronym referring to behavior, intervention, response, and plan. This is a four-stage process, and if you can address these four categories, in your mental health note, you're more inclined to write an effective note and also to fend off the auditor from rejecting your note. You notice I've been referring to these auditors rejecting notes a lot. Let me just explain to you really quickly why that is. When you're writing a mental health note and it's you're billing Medi-Cal for your services, they have to fit under what's referred to as a Medi-Cal Medi billable condition. So there are certain conditions that the state and the federal government recognize that they will use public funds for in order to pay to treat. So things like substance dependency, adjustment disorders to a certain extent, um, some mood disorders, anxiety, depression, things like this. If they don't fall under those categories, you won't be reimbursed for those services. In an agency, if I have 10 clinicians working for me, Okay. And what happens is an auditor is going to come in and they're going to look at all the notes, let's say for one month of service that those clinicians have written. That auditor is going to come to me and say, okay, Antonio, I went ahead and reviewed all those notes for the month of June for your clinicians. It turns out that 20% of the notes all right, did not meet the criteria for billable under my audit. So 20% of those notes are going to be rejected, which means that the, the monies that I claimed for those 20% of those notes will no longer be allowed. We have to pay as an agency that money back. Okay, that's bad enough, right? Well, let's then talk about what the state can actually do with that. Now what they can say is they can extrapolate that 20%. So they can say, look, the audit was not only though for the month of June, it was for your entire fiscal year. So what we're gonna assume is if I took a sample and 20% of your clinician's notes were not billable, 20% of the services that you rendered for the entire year or no longer billable. That may sound like a small amount to you, but you have to understand that in a mental health clinic, you can be billing for literally millions of dollars every single year to provide therapeutic services to your clients. If an auditor came to me and told me that 
of our revenue is certain, suddenly owed to the state of California or to the county or whoever that is, that is an enormous hit for any clinic, uh, clinic to take. That could be the difference between a clinic staying open or closing. And so this is what I was talking about is the responsibility that we have not only, not only to our clients, but also to our agencies to write notes in the best possible format, um, which we're going to offer you as a burp today, okay? So burp, when we address the B is behavior, and that means that mental health providers' observations, as well as statements and direct quotes from the patient are being utilized. I'm gonna give you an example, so don't worry. Intervention, okay? are the methods used by the mental health practitioner, that's MHP here, that's anyone providing those mental health services, to address the patient's goals, objectives, statements, and observations. So here they're all linked, they all have to fit together, right? Response is the patient's response to the methods of intervention and any progress that the patient has made towards treatment plan goals, all right, and objectives. And the plan are any revisions to the current treatment plan and course of action for the patient, including the clinician's next steps, and the next session's date. So some of you are saying, well, that's, that's not too bad. Uh, let me see what we can do with that, okay? So I'm gonna give you a real example of how to write a note in burp format and how we can extract it. What's really important to understand is, and I want you to just, there's a disclaimer to this. The next two slides I'm gonna give you are all language, all right, that under the state of California that Medi-Cal might see fit to allow or consider as billable. So if you utilize this language, remember I was gonna teach you how to write like a clinician. If you utilize this language in your notes, these and these here in your notes, you're more inclined to have a note pass through an audit and continue to be billable. Now I told you that there's a caveat to that, okay? What's important to note is that all notes are subject to the auditor's interpretation. It's a moving target is what I'm gonna tell you. So these, uh, this language, these words, this terminology that I'm presenting you today, I offer these in trainings to other clinicians who are completing notes. It's important to understand though, that doesn't mean that tomorrow these same words will be considered billable. When I was a social worker doing case notes and doing mental health notes in particular, it seemed like every single month your supervisor is sending you an updated list that the county's giving them on saying, here's the language that you're gonna wanna utilize okay, in order to effectively write notes in your clinical terminology. So just consider, don't leave and say, well, look, Dr. Mexico said that confronted was a clinical term and that passes billable and therefore supervisor, you're wrong. Mm -mm, don't do that, okay? That would be bad, muy malo. What you're gonna wanna do instead is you're gonna wanna say, okay, it looks like at some point auditors have shifted their focus. I can no longer use coached, but I can use clarified this particular month. Just flow with it. That's what I've done for the past 15 years and that's what's gonna get you through, all right, this process. So let's give you an example and hang in there. This is the final example for this lecture. So stay with me, all right? I know it's been a lot. We're gonna extract the billable language from this note. So you won't see a mental health note written like this, okay? Because you're gonna be given a template. Uh, providers are gonna give you templates, all right, that you're working with on how to complete your note. And you'll be able to apply this burp formatting to the note, okay? Now, what we're gonna do here though, is you're gonna see that some folks are gonna write a note and it's gonna be really broad and general. What I'm gonna do is show you that we're gonna extract the information that is considered billable, applicable to mental health and the treatment plan. And what I'm gonna do is put that on a mental health note for you in burp format so you can see what it's like. Again, I would encourage you when it comes time for your assignment to refer to these lectures here so you can see examples, okay? So let's look at the summary of Samantha again about her therapy session that she had with her clinician. So Samantha is a 13 year old female. She met with her clinician for weekly individual therapy appointments. Samantha started the appointment excited about the visit to the mall she took with her friends. She stated they watched a movie, ate lunch together, walked around the mall and returned home. She stated that school is going well and that she earned a B minus on her English paper. She stated her teacher is a hard grader so she's proud of her work. During the appointment, the clinician discussed treatment goals of, self -decre um, of decreasing self-harm behaviors from three episodes per week to one time per week and decreased the use of her positive, uh, oh, and increasing, I'm sorry, the use of her positive coping mechanisms from two times per week to five times per week. During the appointment, Samantha shared that she has been arguing more with her mother lately. 
Samantha shared that her mother is continuing to be nosy and asks her where she is going and who she's hanging out with. Samantha states that her mom questions, her mom's questions are frustrating me and pisses me off, quote unquote. Samantha then shared that she is upset. She tries to use her coping skills, but sometimes it's easier to just cut a little bit, all right, to take the edge off her anger. Samantha states that she's been uh, that she's tried uh, her coping skills about three times this week, but states that cutting makes her feel better faster than her coping skills. Samantha and her clinician talked about her coping skills um, she can use when she gets upset and also talked about her mother's attempts to keep Samantha safe. Samantha and her clinic, uh, clinical, sorry, that should be clinician, talked about the safety plan together and rehearsed a few of the options for use of coping skills. Samantha says she's going to try to be less pissed off with her mom this week and chill out a little more. Samantha states that, she, that her cutting kit is something still difficult for her to get rid of and knows that she will have to eventually. Samantha and her clinician talked about ideas for updating the treatment plan and scheduled next appointment. So if you were to submit this note to me and this was on a clinical template, I wouldn't be extremely alarmed, okay? I know we would have some work to do, um, some training to do, but this isn't the worst note that I've ever seen, okay? Now, here's what's important to understand. Again, you're not expected to be experts in this when you leave this semester. But I wanna show you then what it looks like to utilize the language here, billable language, captured in clinical terminology to write a mental health note in burp format. So what I'm gonna do here is, Let's look at what we've got here. This is a typical format, all right, for providing mental health services, uh, your progress note um, after a therapy or therapeutic services session. Now, what's important to understand is some of you may be wondering, is this going to come on actual hard copy form, paper form, or is it going to be an electronic database? How will this format look? Regardless of what it comes in, this is usually going to be about the same. In fact, for LA County's mental health, and for Riverside County, they're very similar, okay, because the counties report to the state on what's billable in terms of services. So they're gonna look very similar in their formatting. Um, in the early days, back when I drove a dinosaur to work, okay, uh, I had to handwrite my notes. I literally had to write, handwrite the notes, not even on a Word doc. Later on, about two years into my case management, we actually started using a Word doc, all right, and nowadays, right? You guys, you kids are get to write on um, an electronic database. So instead of busting out a piece of paper and a pencil, you're going to log into a database online. You're going to sign in, access your client, and you will type out these notes into an electronic database. Your supervisor is then more often than not going to re, um, uh, sorry, review your note on the electronic database. They'll sign into their account. They're going to see all the notes that you've completed for your clients. They're going to read them and then they may kick them back for revisions. You'll hear this form in the field of mental health refer to kicking back notes. When you get a note kicked back, that means that your supervisor asked you to make some revisions to your note to better align it all right, with BERP format or to pass an audit or to justify the services that you are billing. So they're going to give you feedback related to your note. Okay, so, so let me give you an example of a note that would require little to no feedback all right, if you were to submit this um, to your supervisor. So here's our mental health note. Again, the difference here is you would be reviewing this, uh, inputting this note on an electronic database. So this is why it's just on a Word doc here so you can get the content of the note, but it'll look different depending on who you're working for. I wanted to draw attention to two quick things, and again, we are almost done. Anything in red here come directly, these words come directly off of the list of the Medi-Cal language that I provided in the slides, okay? So I, want to, I wanted to illustrate for you how I've embedded, all right, the language into this. Any of the blue items, okay, that you see here, that I put here in these letters, those are the areas of behavior, intervention, response, or planning that refer to the BURP format. I did this so that you can see literally how I'm addressing BURP in my note, okay, and how I'm folding in mental health language to justify me billing services for this client, okay, for um, Samantha. So I'm not gonna read the entire note to you, except I will get into the intervisions. So if you notice here at the top, all right, what we see are the problems, symptoms, or, 
for focus during the service. Again, many counties are gonna require the same update. If you notice, I'm referring to behavior in here, right? Because I'm discussing what problems or symptoms we're addressing. So the clinician and client discuss symptomology onset prior to the initiation of therapeutic services. Listen to the language there. Very different from non-clinical notes, right? Remember when I said you literally need to take off one hat and put on the other? Look at how the style, the tone, the words that I'm writing in my note have changed completely, all right? Symptoms included in self-harming behaviors, such as included, self-harming behaviors included, um, such as negative self-talk, cutting, and suicidal ideation were the focus of today's non-family collateral session. Boring, right? I'm not going to lie. Do you notice this isn't written with flair? This isn't written with adjectives. It's not describing my feelings, my judgments, my interpretations, my opinion. This is solely discussing what I'm here to do for this case. In these mental health notes, the only thing that we document on these templates are what is billable. Billable. It is all about justifying the services we provided and how do they relate to the billable conditions that we are um, addressing in our treatment plans. Here, you'll see the behavioral objectives from treatment plan addressed during the session. What did we address? We addressed treatment goals, right, of decreasing self-harm behaviors. Look at this for frequency, duration, and intensity from three episodes per week to one time per week and increasing the use of our positive coping mechanisms from two times per week to five times per week. In this one sentence here, we have addressed the behaviors, the interventions, what we're gonna do about it, okay? The response, how the client's gonna respond, it would help, I'm just gonna say this right now because I know some of you are thinking it, in a writing class that your professor actually spells response correctly, right? It won't hurt my feelings. I just saw it. I apologize for that. Okay. Talk about humility, right? All right. Um, now let's get into the meat and potatoes of a progress note. In the progress note, what your auditor is going to be looking for, picture that you are now the auditor. You're looking at this note, everything in red. Okay. You've become the audit whisperer, the mental health whisperer. All of this red words, the verbiage here is floating to the top of the note. And this is justifying the services that you've been providing. Everything in red here is going to jump out to the auditor, which is going to justify you doing your job as the mental health practitioner and providing clinical services to your client. This is why I wanted you to literally see the language coming up from the writing. So let's look at this again, pay a note, pay notes to uh, pay attention to the tone of this note. Clinician evaluated, okay, the current monitoring of self-harm behavior exhibited by the client. During the appointment, clinician guided discussion with the client who updated the clinician that she has been arguing more with her mom lately. Samantha informed clinician that her mother is continuing to be nosy and asked where she is going and who she is hanging out with. Client stated that her mom's question, questions are frustrating me and piss me off. Clinician identified client's concerns as potential triggering events and validated the client's feelings. Clinician and client explored current mechan coping mechanisms established to assist client in verbalizing her frustrations to her mother. Client reported that she sh that um, reported. Um, um, sorry, that she shared that when she is upset, she tries to utilize her coping skills, but sometimes it's easier to cut a little bit to take the edge off of her anger. Client reported. That um, that she has tried her coping skills about three times this week, but states that cutting makes her feel better faster. In this section here, in this paragraph, we have addressed um, the behavior and our response to the behavior, and we've utilized language, okay, that will pass a mental health audit to justify those services. Also note that in BERT format, what's also important to do is include language from the clinician in her response, and so we've done that here, okay? Clinician gave feedback to client related to her efforts to utilize her coping mechanisms. Clinician then guided client in a discussion to explore uh, other coping mechanism skills she can use when she's triggered or escalated and also identified the ways the client's, um, the client's mother may be attempting to keep Samantha safe, okay? Clinician role modeled safety plan for client together and rehearsed a few options, um, a few of the options for continued use of coping skills. These both address right, intervention and response, if you notice. Here, we're gonna address response in the plan. So the outcome was client stated she will try to be less pissed with her mom this week and chill out a little more. Client stated that her cutting kit 
is still something difficult for her to get rid of and knows that she will have to eventually. And finally, the plan to follow up, client and clinician discussed ideas for updating the treatment plan, agreed to follow up on current treatment goals, and scheduled the next appointment. No additional notes at this time, and here is when your next appointment is scheduled, which will fall under plan. So I hope you can see here, when we change the tone of the writing, right, this is the format, this is the voice and how we will write mental health notes. The language, the words that we use to justify the services are here in red, okay, and they will align with the language that is the Medi-Cal flavor of language that is approved that particular month or week that your supervisor will pass along to you. So I hope that that helps you. And if you notice, it is written dramatically different in tone, right, from the language utilized here in our first vignette. So this is how you can start to tighten up the language of your clinical services that you provide as a social worker. All right, I know I have thrown a lot at you, and as a reward, we have reached the end of our time together. And so I'm going to go ahead and close this out with our centering. And I'm going to bring up my timer at the moment. So if you're anything like I was at the beginning of my career doing case notes, this was tough to grasp, right? Um, the one advantage is, though, I had to sit in one training that wasn't recorded and try to grasp all of it and read my notes later. For you, you have access to this. Um, uh, recording so feel free okay to review this again before you do your assignments and also know that I will implore some grace okay as you're writing these notes I may offer you feedback but just know I'm not going to hit you hard okay this is the point is for you to learn um, so stick with it and just do your best try not to worry okay our scripture verse for today will come from John let not your hearts be troubled believe in God believe also in me right and so Jesus was asking us, right, to take peace, um, to take calmness in our faith, um, that, that Jesus is our gate, right, to calmness, to faith, um, to freeing our hearts of any trouble that's going on. So for the next two minutes, let's just think about this word and focus in on this word to believe. What does it mean to believe? What is God asking you to do to believe? Um, in these moments where maybe you are feeling tense or overwhelmed, right? So let's go ahead and make sure our hands and feet are in a nice, comfortable position. Let's go ahead and take that nice, deep breath and let out all of those worries and concerns. Let's focus on what God is calling us to do to believe in Him. And I'll keep track of the time. Okay, go ahead and take that nice deep breath and open your eyes. Welcome back. We're going to close out for today. I can't wait to see you all again, right? Hang in there. Please check Blackboard for your assignments. Know that I am praying for you every single day. That is true. I'm waking up. I am praying for you all to continue to stick with it. This is technical. Please don't place the pressure on yourself. You're not supposed to be experts when you leave this class. You are leaving with a foundation to serve you later reach out to me with any questions. I am here. I'm not doing anything else. I just sit in this room all day long and wait for your emails. Not entirely true, but I do wait for your emails and I'm always happy to respond to them. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Have a fantastic week. Talk to you later.